appreciate that. And thank you for inviting us to talk. We're looking forward to this uh, session. Um, my name is Guy Robinson. Yes, as mentioned, 20 years experience in software and cybersecurity, been a pen tester, developer. Uh, I've done a lot of work with OWASP and really appreciated our time with OWASP. I've rolled off being on the board now at the end of last year, um, but we've been involved in the code review guide. Um, we've been a contributor to ASVS. We've done the uh, 2017 OWASP conference in Belfast in AppSec Europe. So it's been a lot of fun working with OWASP over the years. And what we're going to do here is we're going to take it easy. We're going to discuss a number of challenges in around the world of DevSecOps or shift left or secure by design or security as a service, whatever it is you want to call it. Um, because there's lots of organizations that are moving towards that sort of area of uh, looking into things. So if I just manage to click my screen forward. So what the heck is this talk about? So a lot of people are moving left. They're moving into um, DevSecOps. It is hard. It can be slow. And it can suffer from a lot of uh, false starts. And what we seen was, you know, we talked to lots of uh, hundreds of clients and uh, conversations and conferences, et cetera. And you see the same patterns, the same things come up uh, time and time again as companies have moved from their traditional or agile nature of working into more of a the CICD, your DevSecOps, your wrapping security tools into your software development organizations. And we sort of saw that a lot of people were not talking about these challenges, you know, they weren't uh, sharing them. And a lot of companies were thinking, gosh, are we the only ones who are having a hard time getting started here? Or a lot of people were thinking, well, what, how do I get started? What's the things I need to think about when I'm doing a shift left? Um, uh, approach, especially from the culture and from the technical point of view. So in honor of OWASP, we have put together our OWASP top 10 list, uh, sorry, top 10 list of challenges for DevSecOps that we've seen people run into you time and time again. Now, we've got 30 minutes here. Oops. Thank you very much. I've just been told I'm not sharing my screen. First hurdle field for myself. <laughs> Thank you for alerting. Um, so hopefully that's my screen sharing now. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about these 10. Now, we don't have time to go into detail. Each of these types of challenges could be a two or three hour conversation over a few pints. So we're going to skim the, cover, the, the top of them. They are really to drive conversations. They are to make you think about, are we covering this sort of angle? Are we seeing that type of pattern, that sort of challenge in our own organization? And uh, are there ways we can move around that there? There are a number of blogs, we and other organizations that will have on this sort of area. So do your research, look it up, and see if there's other ways and other solutions out there whenever you want to try and uh, get some of those things solved. But we've got around about two minutes each for the uh, each of the 10 uh, challenges. We'll go into that there, and we'll see if we get some uh, information passed on. So just to be able to click my screen again. Challenge number one is starting in the right way, planning your approach. We see lots of organizations that um, have the thought process that, well, if I'm going to shift left, let's get started. Let's just take a tool or take something, wrap it into our process or our CICD, uh, hook the API up, and then that's, that's job done. You know, We've started, we've made, we've made progress. And that is a way to get A, um, tool wrapped in, but it's not a DevSecOps or a shift left approach. We see lots of people running into issues with that, and we'll cover a lot of that in this talk. But one of the first things to think about is what is the aim? Why are you doing this here? We've seen organizations almost do the automation for automation's sake without with losing track of the real aim. The, you know, DevSecOps is all about the efficiency. It's all about automation. It's all about taking away tasks. But at the end of the day, it's a risk-driven approach. It's something that's trying to find new issues in your pipelines, in your uh, code or libraries, et cetera, as it's going through before it goes to release. That is one of the main aims we see people have whenever they try to break down DevSecOps and shift left into a single thing. What are you trying to do? And it's worth just thinking about that and making sure that's almost at the top of your design or your programs that this is all about finding new issues and dealing with them effectively and quickly. It's not about taking your 15 favorite tools and wrapping them in. It's not about having a cool UI or a backlog. It's about the, you know, the end result, which is, are we finding issues? You know, Think about your, your DevSecOps approach from a wider point of view. You might start with one or two tools. Eventually, you're going to drag into plenty of other tools. 
So as you get more and more tools, be them commercial or sometimes open source, sometimes custom things, custom scripts you put together, think about the people consuming that. They don't want 25 different screens or outputs to look at. Make it easy for everybody to work together. You know, it's all about saving times uh, and tasks. And as you say at the bottom here, um, I don't know if this translates outside the UK. That's a definite saying we have here, but, well, and dogs, not on DevSecOps, but a DevSecOps program is for life. Think about the longevity. Think about what that's going to look like in one year, in two years, in five years' time. What does that need to bring into your considerations when you're starting your DevSecOps pro process? Because you don't want something that you've created and start using in the next four to six months to suddenly be a blocker to change to be that more mature DevSecOps process you're going to use in the future. Challenge number two is fit security into your CICD if you can. Obviously, there might be some projects maybe not using CICD yet. You might have different projects, different teams using CICD in different ways. But if you think about your DevSecOps and your shift left, fitting into the CICD processes and fitting into the spirit of the CICD processes that will help you uh, move, move forward a lot quicker. You know, it's not just about taking an API of some tool, hooking that into after the build phase and then send us done because we've talked to a lot of organizations who have done exactly that. But the result is that they have some cool tools often the right hand side here, which collect lots of security issues and find lots of things as it's going through the pipeline. But because it's not wrapped into the spirit of CICD, which means passing the information back, allowing the CICD system to make some decisions based on those outputs of one, two, 10, 15 different tools. You then end up with this nice system you're paying for that's collecting lots of issues, but nobody's looking at it. It's not feeding automatically back into your overall processes. Maybe somebody's going to check every couple of weeks or once a month or whatever, what the issues are there. But that's not really shift and left. That's you may as well run the test, uh, you know, once a month. Then there's no point in wrapping it into your automation. You know, embrace your automation. Think about the automation around your automated tools, because a lot of times when things are going to fall down, it's because of those manual steps in and around the automated tools. So, is there a is there a manual task? Is there something somebody needs to do to kick off? Some of the tools, does somebody need to run around with a spreadsheet after they've run and collect all the different results together and try and do some triage? And is there a way to understand across 20, 30 different tools that maybe have 10 to 100 different SEG to whatever that is? Is there a way to quickly understand in this release, here's the brand new change, here's the issues that were fixed, and here's the issues that have just been appearing? Because again, that's what you want to understand. You don't want to say, right, we've still got 400 issues that we knew about over the last few, few months. You know, the question you really want to understand is what's brand new as we're running through this pipeline. And be expecting to be agile with your DevSecOps. As I say, you'll start it off with a couple of tools. You'll realize those tools are given us certain bits of coverage. Uh, ASVS has been mentioned a few times here, the OWASP application security verification standard, which is a really good technical list of 300 odd controls that you would want to be matching your security against. And if you take a couple of tools and say, right, well, we're covering 10, 20, 30 of those controls, you'll start layering on other tools that will then make you have more controls, but that's bringing it into your automation. So be expecting whatever you're designing in terms of DevSecOps or shift left, that the tools are going to increase and the tools are not the knob. They're not the nebulous of your DevSecOps process. Your process has to be standard, has to be consistent, has to be repeatable, regardless of what tools come in on top of that. So have that way of thinking about how it's going to fit into CICD. And be aware of your friends. If, if we're talking here to security people, and there's obviously developers involved and the operations teams who run the CICD, the CICD team are not going to implement thousands of lines of code inside their Circle CI or Azure DevOps or GitHub Actions, or whatever, to facilitate security. That is just not going to happen. That's going to be unmanageable and eventually ends up being a sort of DevSecOps shift left platform being engineered inside something like Python or Bash Scripts or whatever it is inside your CICD systems. 
that's unmanageable and it becomes very hard to maintain going forward and actually ends up slowing everything down. And that's if, and that's if you're able to get to see the, the DevOps team to actually create it in the first place because of all the different pressures they have of developer velocity and digital transformation and all this uh, agile DevOps. You know, security is usually not, unfortunately, at the front of the queue when it comes to trying to do changes inside CICD. So be aware of what you can do outside of code implemented inside the CICD to make it a lot easier for that to be to be working. Because also, if you've got different projects, different teams and different forms of CICD, we've seen people who have got four or five different uh, implementations or vendors of CICD, you don't want to be doing that different uh, ways each time for each team. As you say here down to the bottom, automate, automate, automate. Automate 100% of the process and then automate the rest. There is always more thinking to be done of what tasks can be automated because if you know the automation is beautiful because A, it takes away those manual tasks, typically from the security team. I know we are all in an industry which is trying to move security more into development, but taking those manual tasks, again, kicking off tools, bringing together results, triaging, maybe even communicating or having a system of record of these different results, et cetera. Trying to move all of that into development just doesn't usually match up that well. So the more automation you can provide that delivers the functionality and the uh, benefits you want, that's all better. So we always see people just chipping away at the, the various tasks. You know, they automate something and they realize, okay, Somebody has to get involved here. Somebody's you know, checking the results or somebody's having to move across a couple of issues here. Work towards increasing over time that automation as much as you can. Reduce the issues, don't increase. That's <laughs> always one for the, for the development teams. You, know, you never find a developer who will be happy that suddenly whenever four or five or 10 tools are hooked into their CICD system, that they're getting hundreds of issues pushed back to them and being told to do something. Especially as we have seen with some reference architectures or some systems that do implement DevSecOps platforms to bring these tools together. Sometimes they're designed in such a way that it will fail the build in the existence of any security issue. Now, for a lot of people who are involved in security, I don't know I've ever seen any project that has absolutely zero security vulnerabilities. There's always a backlog, different priorities, and different maybe uh, ways of working them down, but there's always going to be issues. So if you get to a point of thinking, well, we're going to design a system that will stop the CICD build on the existence of an issue rather than the priority or whatever, it's just not going to fly. It needs to be something that has a way of understanding how those issues are uh, going to be prioritized. And if you can have a way, as you mentioned before, of dealing with the concept of a security backlog, just like you'd have a normal bug backlog or whatever in Jira, et cetera. But if you understand beforehand, we had a couple of hundred issues. We've got 200 issues in our security backlog. We're going to run these security tools again through the CICD system. And at the end, we've got 202 issues. Now, what you want to do is focus on those two issues. That's the main nub of what you are doing with this DevSecOps system. We already have the 200 issues understood. Hopefully, they've been triaged. Hopefully, they've been understood. Hopefully, they're probably replicated in JIRA or something like that. It's the two new issues you want to be able to focus in on. And you want to have it direct in your IDE or in your screen or in your uh, CICD output. Having to trawl through lots of different tools or outputs to be able to find out what are the two new ones just isn't going to happen in a fast-paced uh, DevOps environment. Uh, and do everything you can. You know, We live in a world with the security tools that do produce false positives, they do produce duplicates, or even just nonsense issues. You know, issues that are technically real, but we just don't care about. You know, the sort of headers issues or something that we maybe have a control somewhere else. So again, back to that automation theme, anything you can do to automate away the handling of those false positives, duplicates, and nonsense issues, will help the whole culture whenever those information is going back to the development teams because they have less times of having to worry, gosh, here's another 15 issues. They're probably all nonsense. I'm going to try and ignore those. They get more uh, confidence that if something's being raised, it's actually a real issue. So keep it on time here. Be aware that you're probably going to end up handling plenty of tools. You know, there's lots of different 
tool types that are out there. So let's think of, we got our static analysis test, software composition analysis, which I didn't add into this slide, dynamic, IaaS, RASP, container, cloud, infrastructure, uh, things that are gonna check for passwords in your code, lots of different types of security tools. And you will not start typically with all of those being included, but you will get to a point where you'll, uh, you'll layer them up because what typically will happen is you'll put in a certain number of tools, depending on your appetite, that might be one, two, three, or maybe five or 10 tools at the start. And they will be able to find issues and they'll work well. And they're going to be protecting you before release by finding certain issues that are, uh, you know, could be a real risk to the company. But other issues will sift through other types of controls that maybe aren't covered by those security checks. And what you'll find is, um, in your pen tests or your other types of security checks later on, or maybe something that's reported via bug bounty, et cetera, you'll see that you don't have a coverage for that type of security technical control. And you'll think, right, well, we need to add in another tool or something that's custom, et cetera. And so you will see that grow over time. So you've got to think from the start, if we're designing a security, a DevSecOps security program, both from the technical point of view, the platform of being able to spin up these tools and run them, but also from the culture point of view, expect, as I said, going forward, that this is going to have a lot of tools in it. And how do you scale that? And how does that make sense? Because also then there's different types of tools. You know, we all use the famous types of commercial tools, the ones that have nice IDEs and the ability to create false positives and the ability to have nice PDF reports and have APIs, et cetera. But you're also gonna have custom tools there and open source tools, you know, things that maybe run from the command line, things that maybe don't have a backlog of issues so you can't easily check what was a, an issue two months ago or two days ago. So expect different types of tools. It's not going to be a DevSecOps system that just talks to nice clean APIs of five or 10 commercial tools. And you're going to think, well, they've got IDEs, sorry, they've got interfaces and they can record false positives. So that's how we're going to handle it. It always extends into like things like OWASAP, into things like OWASP dependency check, um, all their Kali Linux tools and that sort of thing, where they're maybe a bit more command line or they're a bit more set up to be run by a security tester rather than automated in a development pipeline. And think about how you're gonna work with that. And also remember what we see in the large organizations and it always is an area people move into is the need for the development of custom security scripts or custom security tests. You know, any off the shelf tool, I don't care if you're the biggest commercial tool or if you're a really ingenious open source tool, there are certain types of checks that just don't make sense to be put into any off the shelf tool. There are things like your business logic checks that are very specific to the application and how the screens move. Usually checks like things like, uh, you know, what's the passport, uh, password controls, authorization checks, you know, can the British people see the American accounts, those sort of things. There's always those sort of checks and consider how you're gonna take some, somebody's 20 line or 30 line Python script and wrap that into your DevSecOps process. Cause that's sure not gonna have things like an API or somewhere to record the false positives or system of record and that type of thing. Remember that all tools work differently. There's no standardization in how tools are output, how to uh, system uh, static tools versus dynamic tools versus container. It all works differently. So be understanding that you're gonna to have to do some logic handling to map the outputs from various tools into some description you want of what a security issue is and how you want to communicate that around. Most teams also need different toolkits. You know, somebody working in Python will need Bandit and SonarCube and all sorts of stuff. Somebody working in C-sharp, you know, will work on some different. But be aware then that your process should be consistent, but the tools will modify over that. Automate triage as much as you can. Um, probably do the first triage yourself, but then anything you can do, anything you can do to remove false positives, duplicates, or nonsense or BS issues, that's really what you want to do. And if you win at that, then everybody else is thinking, right, we're handling real issues. They'll have more time for the process, but they'll also be, you know, have more time. Sorry, not describe that. They'll have they'll be spending less time triage and nonsense issues if you can find a way to automate that. That's a really important thing. If you can do that, that helps the whole culture as well. Challenge seven, map your DevSecOps and shift left to how development teams actually work. So security teams 
and a penetration test and a security test will have a slightly different mindset than a typical development organization will go through. You know, and you got to think and talk with development teams and really work out in design how you're going to make that work. And one of the examples is things like code repos and containers on a certain project can and often do change. So the scenario where you've got your commercial tool, you go to the team, you say, right, we've got to onboard you. What's the project name? What's the repo name? Or what's the container you're using? Okay, we're going to map that to this project in our spreadsheet, whatever that's going to be. And project A has repo A and uh, container A. Now, after that initial setup, after going through the UIs and getting that done, at some point later on, you're going to be ch changing the container. You're going to go to the CICD system and say, no, we're using this image, this tag now, or maybe we're using that different uh, branch on a repo, et cetera. But that typically won't be updated in the security tool or the 15 I, uh, user interfaces of the security tools. So how do you get the process to work better that way? And usually that's through the APIs you're using with CICD so that the CICD system, if they change the image and tag they're using, that that means, well, that's what you're checking now against JFrog or Prisma or Claire, or whatever that is, rather than thinking, oh, well, I've got, you know, I'm checking image, the old image suddenly you're reporting issues against a different image than they're using and it's all a waste of time. So be mindful of how development teams are actually working in their CICD and in how they're changing their information, repos and um, uh, containers, because that makes sure the security is real. You know, we've had scenarios where people are reporting back issues that aren't even existing in a certain project because it's a, an old repo or an old container. Prioritize properly. Um, this is a bit more of a contentious slide, but for more of what we see, organizations, you know, this is a lot driven by regulations and standards. They are more and more around the world, you know, from you know, New York, CRR 50 to Baffin in Germany to nearly every other standard, NIST, et cetera, are talking about risk. They're not talking about a particular vulnerability, they want to understand the risk. And that maps both to internal stakeholders, if you work in a large organization that's worried about what vulnerabilities are found, also to clients, if you sell your software onto them, they want to know the risk of this issue. You know, they don't want to know so much of the CVSS score or high, medium, low. They want to know what's the risk of this to us. You know, if you take something like an SQL injection, it's going to be reported as high, probably by every tool that would be able to report that. But if you have an SQL injection in a project that's low risk, internal, no sensitive information, you've got a who cares attitude. You know, that's not something that's going to stop our business from running. But if you take the same security vulnerability, SQL injection, and you put it in an external environment, millions of records, including like passports and financial information and healthcare information, then you got something more like the talk, talk hack. You know, same technical vulnerability, probably same VS, CVSS, et cetera high but very different impacts so people are more interested these days in risk than they are in the technical vulnerability technical vulnerability cvss can be used to help create and understand that risk but just putting in high mediums lows is not a way that's going to be still used in five or ten years metrics insights and improvements take advantage of the fact that we are automating that we've got lots of different projects working in different tools uh releasing at different times but you've got so much good data there to be able to see patterns, to be able to see, oh, we keep on running into problems with this type of control, or our pen test keeps on returning that this is a vulnerability, we can start wrapping this in. There's lots of insights you can have there. And if you can manage to capture that, your audit people, but also your stakeholders will love the fact that the DevSecOps or shift left infrastructure or processes are actually add a lot more insights because that's then how you can start better protecting you know, what training courses do we need to do? Do we need to go to Secure Code Warrior and have everybody understand the authorization modules, whatever that may be? That's a real way to help focus on your security going forward. And the last one is communication, both for the security teams and for the development teams. You know, we're in a situation here where what we're aiming for is that the developers will receive security vulnerabilities a lot quicker inside their CICD processes. That will happen more often as well. And what you then start seeing is the security team start getting bombarded 
with questions. So what does this vulnerability mean? What do I need to do? It's telling me I need a certificate. Where do we get the certificates from? All these sort of things. And suddenly the security teams are uh, actually having their time maxed out answering questions, whereas the aim of this here was to save them time and not having to run the security functionality. So anything you can do, be that even simply having a page that describes certain vulnerability fixes, how to add certificates in Apache or how to how we deal with SQL injection, et cetera, and having those ways of quickly communicating those things will help both security not be maxed out, but also means development don't get these random issues in their build and suddenly have to wait two or three days to get an answer. Again, you're breaking the whole efficiency here of DevSecOps for us. So I've put a questions mark here because that's uh, we, we, we're going to go over to the Slack channel now and we're going to answer any questions anybody has. That has been a quick run through of a lot of the DevSecOps challenges we have seen in the industry. There's a lot of people, I think there's a lot of opportunity to talk about it to make sure everybody feels in the same way and they're not falling behind, you know, understand other people are experiencing the same problems. If you have any questions, let us know. Otherwise, use this information, go around, do the research for yourself, look up the blogs. And if you have any questions, please email me uh, and I, we can help you out.